morning, I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. The title of the message is Contending with the Problem of Evil. And I want to pick up where we left off last week as we took time to examine the biblical character of Job. I want to move on from how Job responded to suffering and the problem of evil and continue to look in the book of Job to see how he responded to the problem of evil, to the problem of suffering, and note some lessons along the way that you and I can learn as well. It was Achilles who was the Greek hero in Homer's Iliad during the Trojan War who was killed by Paris with an arrow that struck his only vulnerable spot. And that spot was his heel. And so the so-called Achilles heel is the vulnerable or the susceptible spot. Critics of historic Christianity often point that the problem of evil is the weak spot of our Christian faith. Therefore, the problem of evil is often referred to as our Achilles heel. Now we as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ are, are forced to deal with the problem of evil. Yes, the problem of evil or the problem of suffering is a reality. Yes, the problem of evil must be reckoned with. We must deal with it. And as thorny as the problem of evil is, it does not pose any significant threats to the viability, the cohesiveness, or the truthfulness of the Christian faith. Now we, of course, are in a midst of a crisis, both in our church fellowship and also in our community, in our country, and globally. We face the coronavirus crisis, which has really altered the way we live. It has altered the way we shop. It has, it has changed the way we eat. And we've even been forced to, to look at different platforms for worship. It was Steve Camp that encapsulates many of what we have been experiencing over the past several weeks with this crisis. The lyric from his song, is short but it is powerful. It says this, sometimes tragedy comes so suddenly it nearly crushes our soul, but God is sovereign over everything and our pain is in His control. I want you to remember as we study the Word of God today that God stands behind all suffering. God stands behind all suffering. And God is near to those who face the prospect of suffering. God is near to those who face the prospect of evil. The psalmist said in Psalm chapter 34, verses 17 and 18, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and He saves the crushed in spirit. I want to ask you on this day, what is it about the coronavirus crisis that has rocked your world? Perhaps you are going through a season of economic hardship. Perhaps you are, are living through a season of loneliness. You may be afflicted with some kind of a, a sickness that, that leads to all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of fears. What if I have the virus? What will happen next? Or maybe you have begun to question, as many people have in these days, the plans and the purposes of Almighty God. Well, our character Job, in this amazing book of the Bible, he too faced his own dark night of the soul. As we learned last week, within a matter of hours, this godly man, this man of integrity, loses all his children and his entire portfolio is wiped clean. His friends are initially there for him and they remain silent for seven days and seven nights, but then the accusations begin to fly. 
His friends assume that there must be some kind of sin in Job's life. And they wrongly assume that this is the reason that God allowed Satan to afflict Job. Job chapter 13, verse 4, Job says, Worthless physicians are you all. In Job 16, verse 2, he gives them this compliment, and it's not a compliment at all. He says, Miserable comforters are all of you. And then there is this plea of Job. If you turn to Job chapter 31, verse 35, Job says, if I only had someone who will listen to me and see my side, if, if someone would only see things from my vantage point, he says, look, I will sign my name to my defense. Let the Almighty show me that I am wrong. Let my accuser write out the charges against me. You see, Job desires an arbiter, someone to settle a dispute between himself and God. And so Job's pain really turns into a plea, and he begins to subtly question the ways of God. Job chapter 23, verses 2 to 4 he says, Today my complaint is bitter. My hand is heavy on account of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. As I said last week, we began to look at how Job approached the subject of suffering. And I want to pick up and explore the theme of suffering and address a key question that I trust will, will challenge you, and I trust this question will also encourage you. And the question is this, what shall you and I do when suffering threatens to totally undo us and we begin to question the plans and the purposes of God? I want to invite you, if you are with uh, your family or even if you're seated alone, to join me in a word of prayer and ask that God would help us to, to see great and mighty things in Job's life and to see the lessons that he learned that you and I can learn as well. Let's pray together. Now, Father, as we continue this journey in the book of Job and look at Job's response to suffering, and as the story takes a turn during this message, I pray that you would help us to see uh, what went wrong in Job's life and how he began to question your plans and your purposes and what we can learn from that. God, I pray that you would guard us from questioning your plans and purposes, that we would see the lesson that surfaces in this great story, that you would bless this, your people that you would help us to have a strong confidence in your sovereignty, that we would have a strong confidence in your providential plans that are always for your glory and also for our good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As you open your Bible to Job chapter 38, I want to begin by revealing a twofold lesson that Job learns at the end of the book that bears his name. And the first lesson is this, is that Job remembers the character of God. Job remembers the character of God, but the way he remembers the character of God is, is carried out in a totally unique way. Because what happens is he asks for an arbiter, he asks someone to see things from, from his vantage point. He begins to, to question the plans of God. He questions the purposes of God. What happens beginning in chapter 38 is that God's attributes are indeed unveiled. Look with me at Job chapter 38. And I trust that this would, would challenge you right out of the chute as the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. Job 
came into contact with the living God and God directly addresses him. It's as if to say, Job, you want an arbiter? Then I will come directly to you. I will address each and every one of your concerns. And so the cross examination begins from the throne of heaven all the way down to a fallible creature by the name of Job. In this cross examination, we see several things where Job learns that God, first of all, is the creator. Look at verse 4. God says, to Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, God's question continues. The cross-examination continues in verse 8. Or, who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no further, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Here, Job, as the cross-examination begins between himself and God, he remembers that God is the creator. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth, God says to Job. But Job also learns the lesson that God is the master architect. Once again, in verse 5, God says, Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. And Job here is reminded that God is not only the creator, he indeed is the master architect. Job also learns an, an, another lesson. He learns that God is in fact the sustainer. He remembers, he recalls that God only, not, he not only creates all things, he sustains every speck of dust in the universe. Look at verse 12. The cross-examination continues where God says to Job, Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like the clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. Job is reminded that God is not only the creator, he is not only the master architect, but he sustains all things. The book of Colossians chapter 1 reminds us, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And in the context, please remember that Paul is referring now to the Lord Jesus Christ being the creator and sustainer of all things. Hebrews chapter 1 reminds us of this very important theological reality. Hebrews 1.3 says, He is the radiance of the glory of God. That is, Jesus is the radiance and glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And listen, He upholds the universe by the word of His power. In Acts chapter 17 in his address to the philosophers on Mars Hill, Paul reminds them that the God who made the world and everything in it, being the Lord of heaven and on earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he gives to all mankind life and breath and everything else. 
Well, the cross-examination continues in Job chapter 38, 16 to 30. And I won't read all those verses for you. You may read those verses together as a family. But here is something else that Job learns as he remembers the, the attributes of God. That is that God controls the elements of the universe. God controls the elements of the universe, including the oceans and the light and the darkness and the snow and the rain and the thunder and everything in between. God controls it all. Number five, Job remembers and recalls that God controls the, the universe, including the orbits of the planets and the stars. Job chapter 38, pick up in verse 31. But the cross-examination continues. God says to Job, Can you bind the chains of Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth Maseroth in their season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Can you just hear Job under his breath saying, No, no. No. Verse 34, can you lift up the voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens? When the dust runs into a mass and the clods stick fast together, can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in the thicket? And God concludes with this question for Job, who provides for the ravens its prey when its young ones cry to God for help and wander about for lack of food? Job remembers, Job recalls that God sovereignly rules everything and everyone in the universe. In Job chapter 38, verses 39 to 41 that we just read, we also see that God sustains the animal kingdom. Number seven, God demonstrates sovereign control over biological creatures. I would challenge you as a family to read Job chapter 39, verses 1 to 30, the whole chapter, to see how God demonstrates control over the mountain goats giving birth, the time of their birth, the wandering of the ox, my favorite, the ostrich without understanding. It is God who sovereignly oversees the inner workings of the horse and the soaring of the hawk and the eagle. And then something interesting happens. There is what I like to refer to as a, an interlude in the dialogue or a, a break in the action of this cross-examination between God and Job. Look at Job chapter 40, verse 2. The Lord said to Job, shall a fault finder, and that is Job, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Now imagine you are in Job's shoes. You are the one who has demanded a middleman. You have demanded an arbiter. You have demanded a response from God. God, why do you do what you do? Where we are going through this season, this, this crazy season with the virus, we might be tempted to utter a sentence like this to God. God, why would you allow it to happen? And God says to Job, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Notice Job's response. Verse 3, then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? 
I lay my hand over my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. And just as you think the story draws to a close, the cross-examination then continues. Job chapter 40, verses 7 and 8, where Job is answered once again by God out of the whirlwind. Can you imagine it? God says to Job, this fault finder, dress for action like a man. I will question you and make it known to you. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? And then Job continues to learn about the unveiling of the attributes of God. He remembers, he recalls in Job chapter 40, verse 9, that God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. God says to Job, Have you an arm like God? And can you thunder with a voice like His? And you can just, again, once again, hear the muttered cry of Job in his response. And his answer would be a resounding no. God is all-powerful. And then in Job chapter 40, verses 10 to 14, Job recalls, Job remembers that God alone is majestic and filled with glory and splendor. Here's what Job hears from God. Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then I will acknowledge to you that your own hand, your right hand, can save you. Finally, Job learns that man is utterly impotent. He learns that man is powerless compared with the power of the living God. I want to share with you three practical points of application that I trust will encourage you in your Christian journey. Number one, a proper concept of God is crucial in a world which is plagued by evil. Back in 1961, A.W. Tozer wrote a book entitled The Knowledge of the Holy. And these are words that have been with me for years, words that I have never forgotten and I trust that you will never forget either. Tozer says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Among the sins to which the human heart is prone, hardly any other is more hateful to God than idolatry. For idolatry is at bottom a libel on his character. The idolatrous heart assumes that God is other than he is in itself a monstrous sin. And then Tozer concludes with these powerful words. He says, the first step down for any church is taken when it surrenders its high opinion of God, close quote. I fear that as I look at local churches all around the world, that there are churches, churches after churches, who have surrendered their high opinion of God. May that never happen here at Christ Fellowship. May we always hold high the standard of God's holy word, and may we always hold high our view of God, which is taken directly from his word. There's a second lesson that Job learned that I trust you will learn as well, and that is to never forget that God is God and I am not. Isaiah chapter 45, beginning in verse 21, reads, and there is no other God beside me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God. There is no other. 
One of the major lessons I believe that Job learned is that God is God and Job is not. And may you and I learn that lesson as we walk through this season of adversity as well, that God is sovereign and I am not. God is in control of my destiny. I am not. He is the king and I am his servant. He is the Lord and I am his slave. Finally, may I encourage you to make this bold resolution that says, I will never question the wisdom of God. There will come a day, Lord willing, when we will reach the end of Romans chapter 11 in our study through the book of Romans, and we will come to the end of the doctrinal portion, which is comprised of chapters 1 all the way through chapter 11, and we will read these grand words that Paul writes, Oh, the depth and the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has ever given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. This is the lesson that Job learns first of all. He remembers the character of God. When you begin to be torn into shreds, when you are ripping at the seams and you are struggling in your Christian journey as Job was, remember the character of God. But there's a second lesson that Job learns and I I hope that you will learn it as well. And that is that Job responds to God with reverence and repentance. I want to have you turn with me to Job chapter 42, beginning in verse 1, and we see a couple of things that are only for our instruction and our edification. And the first thing we see is that Job worships. In Job chapter 42, verse 2, we see Job responding to God, and he says this, I know that you speaking of God, can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. We learn this as Job worships. He admits that God is indeed all-powerful. But he also admits this. He admits that God's purposes are never thwarted. And here is where we make key distinctions in our Christian journey. First, we understand that God has a will of decree. That is to say, in eternity past, God has ordained whatsoever comes to pass. We call that God's secret will. His will of decree, you see, is never frustrated. It is never spoiled. And as Job confesses, it is never thwarted. In John Piper's first book, Desiring God, he pens these words that have encouraged me so many times over the years. Piper says of God, if none of his purposes can be frustrated, then he must be the happiest of all beings. Just as our joy is based on the promise that God is strong enough and wise enough to make all things work together for good, so God's joy is based on that same sovereign control. He makes all things work together for his glory. Close quote. And so there is the will of decree. The will of decree is never thwarted, as Job confesses. But then there is also what theologians refer to as a will of command. That is, God reveals his will through his law, through his word, and through his commandments. And we see this, that his will of command is violated every day. His commandments are disobeyed every day. And here is the tension theologically. You see that when a creature violates one of God's commands, when he violates a will of command, he also fulfills the will of decree. It's an amazing theological reality how God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called 
according to his purposes. God uses our good decisions and he will also use our bad decisions that we will rightly be held accountable for, for his glory. Thirdly, Job admits the foolishness of speaking presumptuously. Look at Job 42 verse 3. Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I didn't know. In Job's questioning, he tried to articulate the mystery of God's purposes, things too wonderful, things that he knew nothing about, and so he admits the foolishness of speaking presumptuously. And as we tie these three realities together, we see that Job worships before the living God. But there's something else that he does. Job repents. Look at Job 42, verses 5 and 6. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. I want you to notice how reverence and repentance now are somehow mysteriously linked. It is significant, I believe, that Job says, therefore. It is as if he is saying, there was a time when I questioned your character, I was wrong. I was dead wrong, God. Will you please forgive me? May God bring all of us who question the purposes of God to the place where he brought Job, where we will confess, God, I don't know what I'm talking about. God, you are the king. I am your servant. I do your bidding. I love you. I strive to worship you. And frankly, I don't know what I'm talking about. I repent in dust and ashes. Let me close by looking at two very important, important points of application. Number one, humility precedes blessing. This is the principle of James chapter 4, verse 6, that God blesses the righteous one, but never presume on God's grace. God can bless as he chooses, and his purposes are always good and right. To remember this lesson, God owes you and I nothing. Every gift is a gift of grace that is totally, totally undeserved. Not only does humility precede blessing, but humility is the precursor to reverence and repentance. What will reverence and repentance look like for you? People tend to respond, I believe, to pain in a variety of ways. And I want to ex expose those different ways that people respond to the pain in their lives. The first option is this. You can bury your head in the sand. It's what I refer to as soft rebellion. When you endure a season of adversity, when you endure a season of suffering, there are some people who simply don't want to deal with the reality. So they bury their head in the sand. They refuse to dialogue with pain. And they say things like this, there's nothing wrong with me. I just don't want to talk about it. Or just leave me alone. But inwardly, inwardly, the resentment and the bitterness toward others and toward God grow like a, a bed of untreated weeds in a flower bed. And as a result, there are relational side effects. There are damaged relationships. There are severed relationships. And there are spiritual side effects. Constructing a wall to prevent intimacy with God. This is soft rebellion. Burying your head in the sand. But there's another way that people tend to respond. And it's not soft rebellion. It's what I refer to as hard rebellion. Where you may face affliction with an arrogant attitude. 
with a rebellious attitude. And I found that that rebellion comes in many forms, including getting involved with drugs, uh, quitting school, engaging in uh, pornography or adultery, or getting involved with the wrong crowd. You see, this is a totally different way to deal with adversity. It's a, a shake my, my fist at God mentality. That's how I deal with adversity. It was C.S. Lewis who wisely notes that a person who is enduring pain is faced with only two choices. The choices are rebellion or repentance. Rebellion or repentance. And so I would plead with you, I would urge you, during this season of suffering, during this season of adversity, may your response be a, a repentant response, not a rebellious response. And that leads us to the third form of response, and that is you can bow the knee to a sovereign God. And that's exactly what Job does in Job chapter 42, verses 2 to 6. Facing pain or adversity points us to the important things in life. In his book, The Problem of Pain, C.S. Lewis says it like this, I remind myself that all these toys were never intended to possess my heart, that my true good is in another world and my only real treasure is Christ. My only real treasure is Christ. As difficult as the coronavirus has been for our church family, for our community, for our country, for our planet, this is what I'm convinced of. I'm convinced that God will use this for His good, that He will use it for His glory, that He will draw many people to Himself and that he will light a fire under the followers of Jesus Christ, that he will drive them in humility to his word, that he will drive them to repentance, that he will drive them to worship. And that is my plea for this message, that if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would, you would turn from all your attempts to please God on your own merits, that you would turn from your so-called man-made righteousness, which as we learned last week is, is a stench in the nostrils of God. So says Isaiah chapter 64. My plea with you today is that as we endure this season, the, the season of the coronavirus, that you would turn to Christ for your salvation, that you would find your satisfaction in Him, that you would learn the lesson that C.S. Lewis learned, that all these toys were never intended to possess our hearts, that our true good is in another world. John Bunyan called it the celestial city. That is where our desires truly reside. It's in another world. It's in a cele the celestial city. It's in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I plea with you to turn from your sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a great hero of the Christian faith by the name, name of David Brainerd. David Brainerd was a famous missionary to the Indians on the East Coast who, who battled sickness and depression and persecution and loneliness and a host of external hardships. This is a man who lived to only be 29 years of age, but his God-centered attitude continues to inspire the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ to this day. Listen to what he said before he went to be with the Lord. He said, When I really enjoy God, I feel my desires of Him the more insatiable, and my thirstings after holiness the more unquenchable. He said, Oh, for holiness! Oh, for more of God in my soul! Oh, this pleasing pain! It makes my soul press after God. Oh, that I might never loiter on my heavenly journey. I pray that these words of David Brainerd will encourage you and challenge you. Can you say with David Brainerd, Oh, this pleasing pain? 
it makes my soul press after God? The truth point today is this, that when pain racks our lives, we need to remember the character of God and respond to God with reverence and repentance. We may never understand the reason for our pain. We, never, we may never understand the reason for our suffering. And Job actually never got a reason from God. But we trust him to accomplish his purposes in our lives. And we recognize that even the rod of God can turn in to the kiss of God. And that we will be blessed by God as we remain faithful, as we remain steadfast during the trial that we are living through. Christ Fellowship, we will weather the coronavirus together. When our faith becomes weak, we will turn to our Savior for strength and we will rely on the Holy Spirit for comfort. We will confide, we will come together and find rest with our Christian friends and draw strength from them in the spirit of mutual accountability. And my friends, as we weather this storm together, you will certainly be confronted with sin in your life. You might be struggling with horrible fear or anxiety. You might be struggling with anger. You might be like my dear pastor friend who confessed to me just a few days ago on the phone that the coronavirus has revealed how sinful and idolatrous his heart really is. He said this, when my plans were canceled, when my trip was canceled, when all the things that I held dear were set aside, I realized how all these things had taken the place of God in my life. And it led my friend, friend to the foot of the cross. It led my friend, like Job, to worship God and to be one who would repent at the foot of the cross. And so I'm convinced that our hearts and our minds will be sanctified through this crisis. It was Thomas Watson, my favorite Puritan, who said these words, God's chastening is not to destroy, but to reform. There is one thing we will not do during this crisis. We will not turn from our Savior. We will not turn from the Word of God. We refuse to get bitter. We will be stronger and more fortified when we come out at the other end. It was D.A. Carson who said this, and I'll close. This is, at the end of the day, the ultimate test of our knowledge of God. Is it robust enough that when faced with excruciating adversity, it may prompt us to lash out with hard questions, but will never permit us from turning away from God? That's my prayer for our church family that while we may pose hard questions with humility, that we will never turn away from the living God. That when pain racks our lives, we will remember the character of God and we will respond like Job with reverence and hearts filled with repentance. Let's pray together. Father, bless this your church as families gather together in living rooms as people come together to uh, watch this sermon in a totally different setting. Lord, I pray that we would remember your character. I pray that we would uh, respond appropriately to all that is happening around us, that we would respond to you with, with reverence and hearts filled with repentance. May we learn the lesson of Job well. And as we come to the end of this crisis, whenever it will be, may we emerge stronger personally, stronger as families, and stronger as a church family. Lord, I pray for everyone listening that you would uh, do a great work of grace in their hearts, that they would be drawn together closely in their family units, and that they would be drawn closely with you. 
that intimacy with the Lord Jesus Christ would increase, that it wouldn't decrease, that you would show yourself faithful once again. Thank you for the story and thank you so much for the way that you are transforming your people at Christ Fellowship by your grace and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm.